Hey, fifth grade, time for another installment from The Lightning Thief, Percy Jackson and the Olympians, book one by Rick Riordan, brought to you with permission from Disney Publishing while we are in this time of distance learning. So, I'm going to go ahead, and I'm sure you've been listening all along, but you know that Percy and Annabeth are having a conversation, and she's giving him some background, and they are about to go to dinner and the title of the chapter is my dinner goes up in smoke so i wonder how that's going to happen when i left off i was right around the middle of page 166 on here right about here okay um let's see I'm going to go ahead and reread this chapter and get us back into it. So, again, I'm not doing this to make money. I just want to connect with my babies. All right. Right after we visited, Annabeth continued, the weather got weird as if the gods had started fighting. A couple of times since, I've overheard satyrs talking. The best I can figure out is that something important was stolen. If it isn't returned by summer solstice, there's going to be trouble. When you came, I was hoping... I mean... Athena can get along with just about anybody except for Ares. And, of course, she's got the rivalry with Poseidon. But, I mean, aside from that, I thought we could work together. Thought you might know something. I shook my head. I wish I could help her, but I felt too hungry and tired and mentally overloaded to ask any more questions. I've got to get a quest, Annabeth muttered to herself. I'm not too young. If they would just tell me the problem. I could smell barbecue smoke coming from somewhere nearby. Annabeth must have heard my stomach growl. She told me to go on. She'd catch me later. I left her on the pier, tracing her finger across the rail as if drawing a battle plan. Back at cabin 11, everybody was chalking and horsing around waiting for dinner. For the first time, I noticed that a lot of the campers had similar features. Sharp noses, upturned eyebrows, mischie mischievous smiles. They were the kind of kids that teachers would peg as troublemakers. Thankfully, nobody paid much attention to me as I walked over to my spot on the floor and plopped down with my minotaur horn. The counselor, Luke, came over. He had the Hermes family resemblance, too. It was marred by that scar on his right cheek, but his smile was intact. Found you a sleeping bag, he said, and here I stole you some toiletries from the camp store. I couldn't tell if he was kidding about the stealing part. I said, thanks. No prob. Luke sat next to me, pushed his back against the wall. Tough first day? I don't belong here, I said. I don't even believe in gods. Yeah, he said. That's how we all started. Once you start believing in them, it doesn't get any easier. The bitterness in his voice surprised me because Luke seemed like a pretty easygoing guy. He looked like he could handle just about anything. So is your dad Hermes, I asked. He pulled a switchblade out of his back pocket, and for a second, I thought he was going to gut me, but he just scraped the mud off the sole of his sandal. Yeah, Hermes. The wing-footed messenger guy. That's him. Messengers, medicine, travelers, merchants, thieves, anybody who uses the roads. That's why you're here enjoying Cabin 11 to hospitality. Hermes isn't picky about who he sponsors. I figured Luke didn't mean to call me a nobody. He just had a lot on his mind. You ever meet your dad, I asked. Once. I waited, thinking that if he wanted to tell me, he'd tell me. Apparently he didn't. I wondered if the story had anything to do with how he got his scar. Luke looked up and managed to smile. Don't worry about it, Percy. Campers here, they're mostly good people. After all, we're extended family, right? We take care of each other. He seemed to understand how lost I felt, and I was grateful for that because an older guy like him, even if he was a counselor, should have steered clear of an uncool middle schooler like me. But Luke had welcomed me into the cabin. He'd even stolen me some toiletries, which was the nicest thing anybody had done for me all day. I decided to ask him my last big question, the one that had been bothering me all afternoon. Clarice, from Aries, was joking about me being big three material, then Annabeth, Twice she said I might be the one. She said I should talk to the oracle. What was that all about? Luke folded his knife. I hate prophecies. What do you mean? His face twitched around the scar. 
Let's just say I messed things up for everybody else. The last two years ever since my trip to the Garden of Hesperides went sour, Chiron hasn't allowed any more quests. Annabeth's been dying to get out in the world. She pestered Chiron so much he finally told her he already knew her fate. He'd had a prophecy from the Oracle. He wouldn't tell her the whole thing, but he said Annabeth wasn't destined to go on a quest yet. She had to wait until somebody special came to the camp. Somebody special? Don't worry about it, kid, Luke said. Annabeth wants to think every new camper who comes through here is the omen she's been waiting for. Now come on, it's dinner time. The moment he said it, a horn blew in the distance. Somehow, I knew it was, a, it was a conch shell, even though I'd never heard one before. Luke yelled, Eleven! Fall in! The whole cabin, about twenty of us, filed into the commons yard. We lined up in order of seniority, so of course I was dead last. Campers came from the other cabins, too, except for the three empty cabins at the end, and cabin eight, which had looked normal in the daytime, but was now starting to glow silver as the sun went down. We marched up the hill to the mess hall pavilion. Satyrs joined us from the meadow. Naiads emerged from the canoeing lake. A few other girls came out of the woods, and when I say out of the woods, I mean straight out of the woods. I saw one girl about nine or ten years old melt from the side of a maple tree and come skipping up the hill. In all, there were maybe a hundred campers, a few dozen satyrs, and a dozen assorted wood nymphs and naiads. At the pavilion, torches blazed around the marble columns. A central fire burned in a bronze brazier the size of a bathtub. Each cabin had its own table covered in white cloth trimmed in purple. Four of the tables were empty, but cabin 11's was way overcrowded. I had to squeeze on to the edge of a bench with half my butt hanging off. I saw Grover sitting at a table tw sorry at table 12 with Mr. D, a few satyrs and a couple of plump blonde boys who looked just like Mr. D. Chiron stood to one side, the picnic table being way too small for a centaur. Annabeth sat at table six with a bunch of serious-looking athletic kids, all with her gray eyes and honey-blonde hair. Clarice sat behind me at Aerie's table. She'd apparently gotten over being hosed down because she was laughing and belching right alongside her friends. Finally, Chiron pounded his hoof against the marble floor of the pavilion and everybody fell silent. He raised his glass. To the gods! Everybody else raised their glasses. To the gods! Wood nymphs came forward with platters of food, grapes, apples, strawberries, cheese, fresh bread, and yes, barbecue. My glass was empty, but Luke said, Speak to it, whatever you want. Non-alcoholic, of course. I said, Cherry Coke. The glass filled with sparkling caramel liquid. But I had an idea. Blue cherry coke. The soda turned a violent shade of cobalt. I took a cautious sip. Perfect. I drank a toast to my mother. She's not gone, I told myself. Not permanently, anyway. She's in the underworld, and if that's a real place, then someday... Here you go, Percy, Luke said, handing me a platter of smoked brisket. I loaded my plate and was about to take a big bite when I noticed everybody getting up, carrying their plates toward the fire in the center of the pavilion. I wondered if they were going for dessert or something. Come on, Luke told me. As I got closer, I saw that everyone was taking a portion of their meal and dropping it into the fire. The ripest strawberry, the juiciest slice of beef, the warmest, most buttery roll. Luke murmured in my ear, burnt offerings for the gods. They like the smell. You're kidding. He warned me not to take this lightly, but I couldn't help wondering why an immortal, all-powerful being would like the smell of burning food. Luke approached the fire, bowed his head, and tossed in a cluster of fat red grapes. Hermes. I was next. I wished I knew what God's name to say. Finally, I made a silent plea. Whoever you are, tell me, please. I scraped a big slice of brisket into the flames. When I caught a whiff of the smoke, I didn't gag. It smelled nothing like burning food. It smelled of hot chocolate and fresh baked brownies, hamburgers on the grill and wild flowers and a hundred other good things that shouldn't have gone well together, but did. I could almost believe the gods could live off that smoke. When everybody had returned to their seats and finished eating their meals, Chiron pounded his hoof again for our attention. Mr. D got up with a huge sigh. 
Yes, I suppose I'd better say hello to all you brats. Well, hello. Our activities director, Chiron, says the next capture of the flag is Friday. Cabin 5 presently holds the laurels. A bunch of ugly cheering rose from the Aries table. Personally, Mr. D continued, I couldn't care less, but congratulations. Also, I should tell you that we have a new camper today, Peter Johnson. Chiron murmured something. Um, Percy Jackson, Mr. D corrected. That's right. Hurrah and all that. Now run along to your silly campfire. Go on. Everybody cheered. We all headed down toward the amphitheater where Apollo's cabin let us sing along. We sang camp songs about the gods and ate s'mores and joked around. And the funny thing was, I didn't feel that anyone was staring at me anymore. I felt that I was home. Later in the evening, when the sparks from the campfire were curling into a starry sky, the conchorn blew again and we all filed back to our cabins. I didn't realize how exhausted I was until I collapsed on my borrowed sleeping bag. My fingers curled around the minotaur's horn. I thought about my mom, but I had good thoughts. Her smile, the bedtime story she would read me when I was a kid, the way she would tell me not to let the bedbugs bite. When I closed my eyes, I fell asleep instantly. That was my first day at Camp Half-Blood. I wish I'd known how briefly I would get to enjoy my new home. Foreshadowing much? Dun, dun, dun. So, the next chapter is We Capture a Flag. It's a very action-packed game in the book. So, um, I hope you've enjoyed the conclusion to Chapter 7. I will be posting Chapter 8 by tomorrow. Love to you all. Bye-bye.